It's Matthew 24, verses 45 and 46. And it reads, Who then is the faithful, thoughtful, and wise servant, whom his master has put in charge of his household, to give to the others the food and supplies at the proper time? Blessed, fortunate, and happy is that servant whom when his master comes, he will find him doing so. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Brian. Get this out of the way. I am loud enough to be heard over the internet without any amplification whatsoever. It is a miracle of technology. Um, before we begin, I just want to point out to you that it is a quarter of, roughly. We got started late because Brian had a really awesome Sabbath school. Um, so if it's quarter after and I'm still going, this is not a repeat of my last sermon where I'm going to go on for an hour and a half, I promise you. Also, apropos of nothing, look at that picture. Ain't that cool? That's uh, uh, a guy, a uh, tech YouTuber I follow, created this composite image uh, from the most recent uh, solar eclipse. Put it all together so you can kind of see the transit. I, know, I thought it was kind of cool looking, so I decided to share it with you. Anyway, hope you all, if you didn't know, I, I, I was the guy with like my head in the box watching a thing, like, you know, first grade style. That was, uh, that's, that's how I roll and solar shades and stuff. I, I can't deal with that. Um, a couple weeks ago, we finished up a 20-part seminar on discipleship, and we've talked about it a little bit today. Um, I want to mention to you that, uh, you know, I'm back up there. If you missed any of those, or indeed all of those, um, they're available on our YouTube channel. You can go to youtube.com slash at Pittsburgh SDA, or on the church's website at pittsburghsdachurch.org. Covered a lot in those 20 sessions, amen? amen? All right. Now, some might say that the session on the second beast of Revelation 13 was particularly comprehensive. Others might say other things, and they'd be right. Well, since before that series began, I've been thinking and praying about not just what happens during the series, will people show up? Will lives be changed? Will hearts be given to God? But I've also been thinking about what happens after the series ends. In other words, now. Um, for some of y'all, you've learned something new about Jesus. And you have the opportunity to put that new thing into practice with how you live your life going forward. Others of you, You've been reminded of things that you maybe once knew but forgot. Maybe just uh, you heard them presented in a new way and it kind of like clicked in your head better than it ever had before. Or maybe this is, it's just like seeing an old friend that you haven't seen in a while. And some of us, I might say most of us, maybe even all of us, have been under the conviction of the Holy Spirit relating to something that was presented during the series. Maybe it's Sabbath keeping. Maybe it's a decision to be baptized, which the Holy Spirit's been after you for years and years and years, and now you realize it is truly time to decide. Maybe it's uh, Brian's presentation on how we care for our bodies. You know, how do we relate to those around us? There's, if you, Brian did a cool thing in Sabbath school this morning. If you weren't here, you missed it. You should have got here. Uh, the difference between addition and multiplication, right? There are as many possibilities as there are people that have heard the messages, the presentations, multiplied times the number of, of topics covered in those messages, right? That's the matrix. And so my question for you today is, what are you going to do about it? And I have to ask the question of you because I have to ask it of myself. And quite frankly, I like y'all. I like your company. And I thought that maybe if we answer this question together, we can kind of go forward on this spiritual journey together. Now, 
what are you going to do about it? Let's break this down. I, got, I, I didn't know that, that Stephen Champion was going to be here. He's a teacher. And as a teacher, he's horrified by my grammar. So just to prove to you, Steve, that I, I do know a little bit about grammar, I'm going to tell you that there's a subject and a predicate in that certain sentence. I remember that from, like, I don't know, second grade, maybe, I don't know, whatever. To just help us kind of focus our minds on where to start. What are you going to do about it? So the it, I think we each have our own it, right? That thing that has been kind of nagging at us for weeks now. And if you're like me, you probably get a, get a list of things that are it. But the predicate, if I were to speak properly, includes the verb do. What are you going to do about it? And that means that the question that I've posed involves taking action. And what sort of action should that be? Well, I mean, the yeah, options are endless. I mean, we could go corporate and I could get like a whiteboard up here. We could do a Kanban thing where you stick all the sticky notes up on the board and all that stuff. Um, but if there's one thing I think that was reiterated over and over and over again in the seminar, it's that when we have questions about Jesus and what he wants for our lives, we shouldn't go corporate. We should simply go to the Bible and ask Jesus. So let's take a look. Um, because this is not a unique thing. We are not uniquely sitting here having never before, nobody in the history of anything, ever had to answer this question in their own life. This has been a thing going all the way back. I'm not going to go all the way back because I promised you and I'm going to preach for an hour and a half this time. But let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 24. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, I'm going to set the scene for you here real quick. King of Israel is this dude named Saul. Right? Saul had been anointed by Samuel the prophet, which is why we're in the book of 1 Samuel. Um, but Saul, had, Saul was like this like, meek, mild, pretty chill dude until he became king and it went to his head. All right? He's messed up a bunch. He's ignored the words of God. Um, and if you go to 1 Samuel 13, you'll read more about that. Um, the prophet Samuel has already told him, like, look, dude, this whole, the, the line of Saul being king, uh-uh, not happening. Find somebody. God has found another. And that other was this guy named David. So, anyway, let's read this here. Um, oh, wait. Yeah. A little more background. Saul messed up. Saul's, gonna, Saul's got to go. David's going to be the next king. David knows it, and Saul knows it. Saul ain't happy about it. And so Saul is saying, I got a solution to this problem. I'm just going to kill this dude, and then he can't be king. And if he can't be king, well, then, you know, my family can keep being king. Makes sense, right? So, I mean, David was hiding. If David was hiding over here, somebody tells Saul, Saul's, boom, right over there. David's just hiding over there. Somebody tells Saul, boom. Saul's right over there. He's on his heels. And that's where we pick up the action here. So this is Saul. It says, It came, came to the sheepfolds along the way where there's a cave, and Saul went into the cave to take care of his business. Now, David and his men were already in that cave. i got to tell you, there's a lot of caves over there. A lot, a lot, a lot of caves. That's what you guys heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? They're found in like the 50s. Right? Or 47, maybe? I did Somewhere back there. How was it that those Dead Sea Scrolls managed to sit in a cave that long without being found? The place is lousy with caves. There's caves everywhere. What are the odds that you're hiding from the king in a cave, and the king happens to go in that cave, not because he knows that you're there and he's going to kill you, but because he's got some personal business to do and he likes a little privacy. What are the odds? They are right about 0%, right? But that's what happened. Now, David's boys, the mighty men, right? They said to David, to go, check it out, man. This is the day. You remember, God told you, I'm going to give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Now, Lots of people would have gone, you right. And whoosh, end of Saul. But that's not what happened. 
It says David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. So, David's on the run, right? Saul's got blood on his mind. And that's how we end up in a situation where both these guys are in the same cave. David has motive, he has opportunity, and the people in this world that he trusts the most are the most? Wow, man, my English is terrible. The people in this world that he trusts the most have told him, this is it. Remember how God told you? Now is the time. But David, he didn't strike Saul down. Could have. I mean, could have. What does David know that his mighty men of valor don't know? Something, right? Because all his boys are like, let's do it, man. We can quit hiding in these sneaky caves that people go to the bathroom in. He says, nah, no. Nah. Well, you can study this up in different commentaries, and different commentaries will kind of give you some different insights. Um, but most of the things that I read are pretty practical things, like this. Here's David's way of reasoning. If I kill the king so that I can become the king, that sets a precedent of king killing. Right? And as the king, I would rather people didn't have it in their minds that it's cool to go ahead and kill the king. That's a very practical thought. And I'm not saying that it's wrong, but there's more to the story than political expedience. Let's back up a little bit. I'm going to give you some of this background here real quick. This is 1 Samuel 13, 13. Samuel says to Saul, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him as ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Fast forward a couple chapters. 1 Samuel 16. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, him being David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. All right. So, how old was David this time? So he was just a kid. He was the youngest of eight. Now, I'm the youngest of four. And I don't know how it is being the youngest of eight, but I know how it is being the youngest of four. And that's why... I grew up listening to 60s music and early 70s music, even though I was born in 1974 and have no business knowing all these songs that are 20 years older than me. Why? Because I worship the ground that my sister walked on and she's 17 years older than me, and that's how that works. But David knew from the time he was little, little, that he was going to be king. And y'all know the story. I'm not going to go through it. Y'all know the story of David killing Goliath. David was at the battlefield. Why? Because he was this great warrior? Nah. He was a kid. He was sent on an errand by his daddy to say, go get some food to your brothers. That's why David was there in the first place. But David was the anointed of God, and David knew what was up. And so he did that. That's cool. Now, if you know that story, you might know that Saul had promised that whoever could kill this giant, Goliath, not only would he make him rich and all that stuff, but he says, you can marry my daughter. And that's what happened. Saul was trying to get David killed because he knew what the Lord had set up. And he kind of had this amateur vibe of what David eventually did to Uriah the Hittite. We see it here in 1 Samuel 18. Saul says, this to his servants, Thus you shall say to David, The king does not desire any dowry except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. Now, I underlined it here for you. Now Saul planned to make David fall by the hands of the Philistines. In other words, I'm going to send this dude into battle. He's going to get whacked, and my problems are over. Now what happened? David actually comes back with 200 foreskins of the Philistines, just to make sure, we good? I'm in love with this girl. How many dead Philistines do you need? And Saul saw, and he knew that the Lord was, was, that the Lord was with David, and that Saul's daughter loved him. And it says that Saul was even more afraid of David. 
Because his daughter was in love with him? No. Because he knew that the Lord, he saw and knew that the Lord was with David. Thus, Saul was David's enemy continually. It's a real happy family, isn't it? Makes my family look straight down the middle, functional and good. I suspect that none of us would have blamed David if he had taken advantage of the opportunity that he had to kill Saul in that cave. It makes sense. And it's really not until chapter 26 that we understand David's thinking a little bit, and we understand it because he explains it to us, because we don't need to go read some political commentary about ancient Israeli politics when we can just read the Word of God. So let's look at this passage. It's a little bit longer passage. So 1 Samuel 26, starting in verse 7. So David and Abishai, that's one of his boys, came to the people by night, and behold, the people, Saul's army. Saul lay sleeping inside the circle of the camp with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the people were lying around him. So it's like a big campsite. And in the middle of that campsite, you got Saul in his tent with a spear right there. This is the equivalent of sleeping with a gun under your pillow. All right? At a moment's notice, I could jump into action and defend myself. By the way, don't sleep with a gun under your pillow. I'm sure there's probably some way to accidentally shoot yourself in the head and don't do it. Abishai, one of David's boys who's there with him, says to David, this is the cave all over again. He says, today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now therefore, please let me strike him with the spear to the ground with one stroke and I will not strike him the second time. What is what is Abishai saying? I'm a one shot, one kill. I will take this dude out right now. I don't know how he was planning on escaping after that, because, you know, they're still in the middle of the camp and all that. But David, I guess they could talk, right? Because they weren't like in the cave with like Saul right there awake. So David takes the time to explain. So David says to Abishai, this is verse 9. Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? David also said, As the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him, or his day will come and he dies, or he will go down in a battle and perish. Right? God's going to do this however God's going to do it. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Let's not just you know, completely waste this opportunity. Go take the spear that's at his head and the jug of water and let's go. In other words, you go right up to his little bed there and you lift up his little pillow and you take that little 38 special out, put his little head back down, and we'll bail. Right? But you could sum it up like this. Bro, God's got this. God's going to do whatever God's going to do whenever God's going to do it. Right? Don't have to be taking it upon ourselves to do what we think God might want us to do. Stand back and watch and be amazed. Now, I tell you, this is years of David on the run. On, on the run, on the run. Like, there's no comfort. They're, like, sleeping in the... I want to say the grass, but there ain't a whole lot of grass. They're sleeping on the rocks. They're living in caves, hiding here, hiding there. They can't, they can't settle down and plant a crop anywhere. Because if they do, next thing you know, hey, it's all. Dave's over there. And here it comes. David could have easily solved this problem on his own, at least these two times, right? But he doesn't. He says, yeah, life's not a lot of fun right now. Not having a good time right now. But I know that I'm not supposed to do this thing that my instinct says I should do, that my buddies say I should do, that seems like the expedient and reasonable thing to do. David had a choice to make. In my opinion, option A, pretty clear cut goes like this. Kill Saul, become king, 
live happily ever after. Right? Everybody knew that David was going to be the next king. Everybody knew that Saul was trying to kill David. And as we've seen, those mighty men of valor, Dave's boys, they were advising him, do this, man. Option B, in the short term at least, seems a little bit less clear. It's a little murky, right? As David said, ah, hey, you know, ah, maybe the Lord will strike him, or maybe he'll die of old age, or, or maybe he'll go down to battle in the Philistines again. I don't know. But I'm going to wait and find out. Put it to you this way. If you're David, you can't be king tomorrow if Saul sticks a spear through your head today. Right? But David says, I'll risk it. Because I trust. I have faith. I have knowledge. I have an experience with God that tells me, hang back. So like I said, I was thinking about uh, the discipleship series and all this. Um, but about a year ago, maybe more than a year ago, I'm not exactly sure, it's been a while, I was kind of taking a little cruise down memory lane. Y'all ever do that? You get some downtime, somebody says something and it floods your head with memories. And uh, I was doing some team building thing at work, you know, and, and I had one of the things we had to do is tell an interesting fact about ourselves. And I'm not going to bore you with what I... Uh, uh, used as my interesting fact, but it was interesting. Uh, it had to do with back in the day uh, when I made part of my living uh, as a musician. One of the groups I played with was this little Latin band. It was a, kind of a big Latin band, but it was a Latin band uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. And we, we laid it down, man, some salsa, some merengue. It was a good music, man. And one of the gigs we played was at a, a, an event, like one of these like, citywide music festivals, uh, it's called Birmingham Freedom Fest. Birmingham Freedom Fest is held in Kelly Ingram Park, which is that place right there, kind of like the right, that part of your screen. That's Kelly Ingram Park. Over here, I'm going to use the pointer like a real pro. That's the bandstand where we played at 7th Street, 17th Street North. Uh, Kelly Ingram Park, if it sounds familiar to you, or if you uh, uh, know your civil rights movement history, uh, might ring a bell. Um, if you've heard of the, the Children's March in 1963, um, that's where it happened. And the park now, it's a beautiful place. I mean, I haven't been there since the mid-90s, but it was a beautiful place then. I, I assume it still is. Um, and they have this thing called the Freedom Walk, and you kind of go in, a, in that big circle around the center of the park, and they have these like monuments that are built there, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Anyway, we had a great time, we played a great set, and after our set, I was walking around, you know, the next band is playing, and I'm walking around that circle, looking at the, at the monuments. And I, I tell you, there's some stuff in that park that at least as impactful as anything you'll see in Washington, D.C. No kidding. And I'll also say, to me at least, they're a lot more visceral because the people in these monuments aren't wearing fancy powdered wigs. They don't look like George Washington crossing the Delaware. Right? They look like you and I because they are. I mean, 1963 was not that long ago. I'll show you one that, that really got to me. This... Uh, this is a, a statue there. You see the police officer and a dog and kind of pushing a dude, the young man. Uh, it turns out that the young man in this, that, uh, well, here's the picture that was based on. This, this young man here was actually not part of the children's march. He was just cutting class. So that's, I really like this dude because that would have been me. Ah, some children's march thing? Nah, I'm cool. I'm just going to cut school. And uh, you, if, if you could ask my mother, she, she passed now, but she would tell you. Cutting school was like a national pastime for me uh, when I was in high school. So I, I like this dude. Um, 
don't cut class, kids. Just don't do that. Um, yeah, do as I say, not as I did. Listen, there are things that I would change. Um, it, it's funny, the, the guy that took this picture was a, a, a press photographer for Associated Press. This picture was in just about every newspaper in the country, except for the Birmingham News, the next day. Right? It was in the New York Times, it was everywhere. It's not in the Birmingham News, uh, for reasons that are probably obvious. Uh, widely published, that dude never made a dime off of this picture, because it was not credited to him until much later. Kind of sad. Uh, but this is Birmingham, 1963. 32 years later, there I am, I'm playing in this Latin band. And this, this band, it, 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 you know, we had people from all over. Central America, South America, Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, a couple black guys, me, and some white girl on keyboards. It's a big group. It's a lot of fun. Uh, too big to make any money, but that's all right. But this is Birmingham in 1963. But you can't get to Birmingham in 1963 without starting in Montgomery in 1955. Anybody know who that is? Rosa Parks. I think that's a beautiful photograph. That is a pretty lady. I want to show you, share with you some details about Mrs. Parks and the, and the situation that happened on that day. It was December 1st, 1955. So first of all, to understand what happened, you have to understand how this whole segregated bus thing worked. Um, works like this. About halfway down the bus, you have a sign. And that sign is the demarcation point. And if you are looking like me, you sit on this side of the sign. And if your skin's a little darker, you sit on that side of the sign. And so, here's the other thing about it. It's been a long time since I've rode a bus, like not a school bus. But I do remember that when you get on the bus, you have to pay your fare, right? If you're a black person, this is how you did this. You get on the front of the bus, you pay the driver, you get off the bus, you walk down to the back of the bus, and you get back on, and you're into the bus. This is insanity to me. I, I mean, it's insane enough to say, oh, you have to sit back there. But you can't even get there from here. You have to get back off the bus and go around. <sighs> it's as hard for me to believe that a person would do that as it is for me to believe that David didn't kill Saul in that cave. Because I'd have been laying some smack down, just being straight. So on December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks got on the bus, paid her fare, got off the bus, walked to the back door of the bus, got back on the bus, and sat in the front row of that section. It's not the only one. The city bus seats in Montgomery, and I have a photo I'm going to show you here in a minute, they're kind of like I don't know how it is anymore, how school buses are anymore, but when I was a kid and on the school bus, it was like two little bench seats with an aisle in the middle, right? And you could just about fit two people on each one of those seats. And that's how it was on the city bus of Birmingham. And there were four black people sitting one, two, three, four in that first row. And as the wheels on the bus go round and round and the bus goes down its route, more and more people, white and black, are getting on the bus to go wherever they're going. And all of a sudden, the bus driver looks up in his mirror and he sees that there's a bunch of white people having to stand in the aisle because all the seats for the white folks are filled. Well, City of Montgomery had a way to deal with this. And the way they dealt with this was, the bus driver would pull over, he would get up, he would walk back, he would take that sign and he would move it back as many rows as he needed to to make sure there was plenty of room for all the white folks to sit down. That's how it worked. It's not right, obviously, but that's how it was. So that's what he did. Pulls over, gets up, takes a sign, moves it back a row. Now, suddenly, without moving a muscle, Rosa Parks and three other people are no longer sitting on their part of the bus. Three of the four people on that row got up and moved. Rosa Parks did not. 
and the driver asked her why she wouldn't stand up. She said something you could not say more perfectly if I gave you a thousand years and every thesaurus ever made. She said, I don't think I should have to stand up. And she was absolutely 100% correct. Well, for her trouble, she got a free ride downtown in the back of a police car. She was arrested. This is actually Rosa Parks being fingerprinted at the uh, holding center in downtown Birmingham, which I've been to once, uh, incidentally. She lost her job and a lot of other bad things. Why am I telling you about Rosa Parks in the middle of talking about David not killing Saul? Well, because I want you to think about the decision that Rosa Parks had to make that day. It goes like this. There's three options. One, just knuckle down, get up, move back. You're a lady, I'm sure somebody will let you sit down. And that's what the city of Montgomery was counting on. On the other hand, you could pull a stunt house, start, you know, throwing hands and raising a ruckus. Or, on the other, other hand, you can quietly, politely, and yet firmly decline the opportunity to get up out of your seat. You've obeyed the idiotic, evil rules that society has imposed on you. You're doing your best to live a good life under adverse, I mean, to say the least, adverse conditions. But something had spoken in Rosa Parks' heart. And she said, no, nah, I'm done. I'm done. She was asked many years later about this moment. And this is what she said. It's a quote. She said, when that white driver stepped back toward us, when he waved his hand and ordered us up and out of our seats, I felt a determination cover my body like a quilt on a winter night. Right? What does that say? It came over her. It didn't come out of her. This is not the bile and bitterness that one could reasonably expect it came over her like a quilt on a winter night. When it's cold outside and you get up under that quilt and you start to warm up slowly. You know that feeling? That's what she felt sitting on a bus with some dude hollering at her. Well, that was December 1st, 1955. On December 5th, the following Monday, she's in court. She was uh, sentenced. It was a $10 fine plus $4 in court fees, so 14 bucks. Um, it's hard to come up with when you've lost your job. But after all the, the court hearing and all that stuff, the Montgomery bus boycott, which I'm sure you've all heard of, was formed. And it took a year. Court battles, after court battles, after court battles, went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. The city of Montgomery lost every appeal. And by December 20th of 1956, the buses in the city of Montgomery were integrated. They weren't really integrated because of all the court battles. They were integrated because the, the company that ran the city buses was absolutely broke. That's Rosa Parks riding a bus after they were integrated. That dude behind her don't look real happy. I don't care. She had to sit in the front row. Now, I was telling you about David on the run, having to sleep out in the cold, sleep out in the rocks, running, running, running. And you go, that stinks, man. That's rough. And it is rough. Rosa Parks was a, uh, she worked at a department store. She was a, a seamstress, or a tailor, whatever you call it. She lost her job. Her husband was a barber, worked at Maxwell Air Force Base there in Montgomery. He lost his job. They got death threats constantly. And unable to find work, they wound up moving to Detroit, Michigan. Uh, which, I mean, that's, that's like the worst part of all, right? You had to go to Detroit. Um, anyway, 
not a big fan of Michigan. Rosa Parks said, you know, there's what society wants me to do. There's what the people around me that are close to me want me to do. And then there's this other path that is the way that I know is right because of my relationship with God. She wrote a book, and I, I, I haven't read the whole book yet, so I'm not going to tell you about it. But she actually talks in her book about how her faith in God and her relationship with Jesus, uh, how that got her through the difficulty of this time period. I believe that, that she was divinely inspired to do what she did that day. But, you know, she wasn't alone. She's not the only person that had a decision to make. As I said, mentioned before, on December 5th, on a Monday, she was in court. And what happens between the first, whatever day of the week that was, and the 5th, which is a Monday, is everybody goes to church, most of them on Sunday. And what all the churches did, all the, the black churches, as they said, hey, Rosa Parks is going to be in court on Monday about this whole bus thing. So let's do this. Let's remind society of our economic power by not riding the bus that day. One day. And we've seen this since then. I mean, a couple years ago, we had like the don't buy gas on Friday thing. Like you weren't going to go buy gas the next day or whatever. Um, but the community had to decide whether or not they're going to support her in this, right? The estimates are that 40,000 people either took a day off on Monday or figured out some other way to get to work. And I have read that some walked as many as 20 miles. Who's walking? I mean, I, my office is like 20 miles from here, 23 miles. I ain't walking 23 miles for nobody, nothing. Sorry. I work from home, usually, so don't have to. But they kept it up. They didn't just do it on Monday. They didn't just do it on Tuesday. They did it every day. Every day for a year. Until the city of Montgomery had exhausted its legal options and had no choice but to integrate busing. Why do they keep it up? That's hard, man. That's a lot of walking. Black people that own taxi companies would have their insurance revoked so that they couldn't drive, so you couldn't take a cab. It was terrible. But the people of Montgomery, Alabama, in that year, went about their business in a way that challenges me because, frankly, I don't think I'm Christian enough to go through that. Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Dave says, I got two. Right? That's just how... I'm not... I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that I'm just as imperfect as anybody else. It's amazing to me. Why am I telling you this? Y'all went to history class, you know. Maybe you lived through it. Well, it's like I said at the beginning. Maybe you learned something new about Jesus in the last month or so. Or maybe you've been reminded of things that you already knew, but you've been living like you didn't know, or whatever. The point of it is, we've all been challenged to grow spiritually in the last several weeks, and we need to decide how we're going to respond and how we're going to live according to that experience. We need to take this very, very seriously. So, you might have your own mighty men of valor, your own inner circle, those people around you that you trust, telling you something that goes against what you know to be true from the Bible. Right? If that's the case, I want you to be like Rosa. I want you to be like David. And that means demonstrate the truth not by what you say, but by how you live. 
If your livelihood is at risk because you've determined to follow Jesus, oh well. God will provide. David said, I don't have to kill Saul. God said he's going to take care of that. I'm going to let him take care of that. Y'all just chill. And if David could trust his life to God in that way, can we trust our lives to God in that way? I hope your answer is yes. You know, truth eventually is always vindicated. Rosa Parks never got rich off of her name. But when she died, that's her casket there and her body's in it. And that is in the uh, Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. Right? She was, they call it lying in state. And this is just about the greatest honor that you could get as a person in the United States. Rosa Parks was the first woman ever to be given that honor. She was the second black person ever. She would have been the first, but she lived into her 90s. 50,000 people stood in line to walk past that casket to pay their final respects. Why? Because she's this great icon of the civil rights movement? Sure. But she wouldn't be this great icon of the civil rights movement if she didn't know what David knew. Which is that if we trust in God and wait for his plan to be revealed in our lives, it'll all work out. In his time and in his way. I got a dollar, says... They will never put a casket with me in it in the Capitol Rotunda. I'm pretty, I don't know how the odds making thing works, but that's, I mean, I'm pretty sure about that one. My goal isn't that. My goal is that when Jesus comes back, he says to me, well done, well, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's all. If that's your goal, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's, uh, it excites me and, and, and amazes me how you open our eyes to the message that you have, how you can touch those around us, but how you don't force yourself on us. And so, Lord, I just ask that you will give all of us, each of us, a heart to, to listen and to do your will. As we've studied these last few weeks about discipleship and what...